So it's my great pleasure to uh, ask my uh, colleague, Dr. Sidi Kuru, to take the podium with the first presentation, uh, which is sort of about his way into Ottoman studies. It's about uh, memories of the Ottoman Empire, remembering the Ottoman Empire in uh, in Turkey today. Dr. Kuru. <laughs> well, um, hello everyone. It's a great pleasure to be back to Vancouver. In fact, since last year, uh, Thomas and I were working together to introduce our students to each other and to create a Pacific Northwest uh, Ottoman Studies group. Uh, and we are planning to re regularly uh, meet each other, talk about our projects, and uh, get our students to be involved, uh, more involved with the study of Ottoman Empire and modern Turkey as well, hopefully, as it develops. Mm -hmm. Today, my talk will start with the uh, Ottoman Empire as a social phenomenon. Uh, but before I start, I forgot to thank to Adam and Nural for their kind invitation. It's always good to be here. Uh, and uh, then, uh, what I was saying was... Uh, what was I saying? Okay, uh, my talk will be... Uh, we'll start on a uh, general note on Ottoman Empire as a social phenomenon today in Turkey. Then I will talk about how I get this interest to study it because it is not always very obvious for a Turkish uh, young person to have deep interest into Ottoman stuff and to sustain it to do a PhD about it and then became a scholar of it uh, abroad especially. Uh, it all has its challenges. Um, okay, uh, let me start. Uh, Many people know about this TV show. It is uh, about a 16th century Ottoman Sultan, Suleiman, the lawgiver in Turkish, and Magnificent Suleiman, the Magnificent, is known as uh, in English. And uh, the first season of this show is now available on Netflix with subtitles, English subtitles, and it is available on YouTube with, in various languages, like with subtitles. And, various languages from Romanian to, I don't know, Brazilian, etc. Uh, this show lasted four seasons uh, with 139 episodes. Almost each episode is one, one and a half hour long, uh, a movie in itself kind of a thing, uh, between 2011 and 2014. And it was released, uh, it has been released currently like in 49 countries. Uh, it was even called as the second expansion of Ottoman Empire over the globe, like I mean, because uh, it created, it was broadcasted definitely in a region much larger than the territories of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it created currently a spin-off, uh, which is still running, uh, this time about the 17th century Sultana, uh, Kusam Sultan, uh, mother of, the wife of a Sultan and mother of and the grandmother of two sultans. Uh, it is going on, it is uh, also very popular abroad as well. All the palace intrigue, fratricide, filicide, conquests uh, in, that, that are depict, depicted in these shows do not present a very uh, kind portrait of Ottoman family or the empire when we look closer. It is truly a soap opera with evil people, good people, and many people getting killed or suffering many uh, ordeals. But it definitely fueled a great interest in Turkey, uh, which uh, popular books appeared since then on Ottoman history, uh, documentaries about Ottoman family in Turkey and abroad. Um, but it was also a very, it has always also have been, uh, it has been, sorry, it has also been a very controversial show uh, for example, Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan in 2012, one year after the show started, criticized, criticized the show uh, as follows, I quote, This is not the Sultan Suleiman we know. This is not the lawgiver we know. Thirty years of his life was spent on horseback and not in a palace like you see in TV shows. And he continues, I condemn the writers of that show and producers of it in front of my people. This is from a speech uh, when he was, I think, opening that uh, Istanbul 
1453 panorama, a uh, depiction of the conquest of is Constantinople. Uh, Turks have been very selective when it comes to the Ottoman sultans, both uh, picking up some good sultans versus bad sultans. For example, generally Mehmed II uh, is accepted as good. This is the conqueror of Istanbul, uh, like Constantinople, who, makes it, who made it into Istanbul. Mehmed II was good for that. But he was bad for making fratricide uh, the law, uh, a customary law code. Uh, fratricide being you can uh, have your brothers uh, and their families uh, like executed so that there won't be rivals for the throne. This is like a 15th, late 15th century story. Or Selim the Third, my namesake, uh, was definitely accepted as a very good sultan because he was reformist and he tried to follow the Western powers and their ways to reformize the uh, army. Uh, it was one of his purposes which he paid with his life for this attempt. However, I think the most controversial Ottoman Sultan was Abdulhamid II uh, from the second half of uh, 19th century. Uh, he reigned from 1876 until 1909. And uh, he was the sultan who had established the first constitutional monarchy, constitutional like a parliament in the Ottoman Empire, and had it closed down very fast, within a year. And he, he was uh, named, uh, even during his time, as the Red Sultan, Kızıl Sultan, uh, Kızıl Sultan uh, by uh, Turkish uh, Ottomans of that era. And, he would be remembered by uh, Republican state ideology as such as well, as a very oppressive sultan who tried to cut the way of nationalist developments in the Ottoman Empire. On the other hand, uh, he, would, he would have been defended vehemently by reactionaries and he would be called Ulu Khan, the supreme leader uh, by many rightist conservative groups uh, during his time and then uh, in the early Republican period. Sorry. Uh, during his time. Um, and uh, Turkish, uh, like Abdulhamid II, became the uh, topic of a very recent show that started this year, 2017. This time produced uh, and uh, commissioned by the Turkish state television, TRT. We call it. And in this uh, TV show, we have a very different depiction of an Ottoman Sultan who is like really modernizing, thinking, who has crazy projects to modernize the empire. And uh, this is in stark contrast to the depiction of Suleiman the Magnificent of 16th century as a, a person who is really uh, more uh, emotional and fallible, etc. Abdulhamid appears in this series like the person, the guy, the main guy, kind of a thing. While uh, private channels, in a sense, pushing the an exotics of Ottomans uh, uh, through TV shows, projects, etc., the state TV generally uh, presents a valorization of this past uh, empire. There is another show uh, which has been uh, long running. It is, I think, the third season of it. Resurrection, which uh, is the story of the father of the founder of the Ottoman Empire, uh, Ertuğrul. And it is also, uh, again, a hero cult is established in that show as well around Ottoman Sultans. Since 2010, in Turkey, there have been many project, uh, projects named after Ottoman Sultans as well. Named Ottoman Sultans. For example, recently, last year, uh, Gülhane Military Medical Academy, Gata, uh, was changed into, uh, it, its name was changed into Haydar Pasha Abdulhamid Training and Research Hospital. You can see it on the lower left corner of this uh, conglomerate of slides. And the third Bosphorus Bridge, which is a bit cut off by the screen, but uh, you can see there is named after a 16, early 16th century sultan, again my name say, Yavuz Sultan Selim, Selim the Grim. And uh, there were other uh, events going on, for example, the opening of the uh, Istanbul 
pano uh, 1453 panorama, which depicts uh, it's the major event in fact in 2009, and a very well executed project, uh, which shows the conquest of the city by Ottomans. Uh, has been gathering a lot of tourists and Turks, etc., uh, celebrating in a sense a war uh, 550 years or more ago. And on another slide, you can see that it's from Strasbourg during the recent referendum. Some voters uh, kind of put on dresses representing Ottomans uh, just to vote, vote for the referendum. This is kind of use of this Ottoman past. Um, is a political message or a political uh, statement. You can see last May 29th in Taksim Square, there were Ottoman archers, uh, statues of Ort Ottoman arch archmen uh, in Taksim Square. So Ottomans are becoming more and more uh, in the public uh, space or through TV, through naming of major projects through even clothing, because during the referendum, uh, before the referendum, many representatives also posed in Ottoman clothes and they were on billboards in cities. But these developments are really different from an earlier interest in the Ottoman Empire that began after the September 12, 1980 military coup, coup uh, which was uh, when Ottoman culture was taken as an intellectual resource by uh, very famous novelists like Orhan Pamuk's Karakita is all about this uh, kind of conflict between the Republican ideals and an Ottoman past, how Ottoman past is buried under layers of uh, ideological approaches to life. And Ihsan Oktay Anar's more complex novel that brings up an Ottoman sentiment through mysterious and mystical through a mysterious and mystical story. So uh, this movement starting in the uh, 90s after the coup turned today into a more, more political act than an intellectual dis rediscovery and uh, dominating our minds. I would like to tell you my own story about this empire. Here you can see a large map of it. Uh, the yellow spot is the earliest borders of an Ottoman Emirate, which would uh, expand east and west gradually to reach uh, really huge borders. Today, Turkey is only less than one-fifth of the uh, former uh, territories of the Ottoman Empire. So, uh, Ottoman Empire spent uh, more than uh, 600 years and came to an end only in 1923 when it was replaced by the Turkish Republic and various successor states in southeastern Europe and the Middle East. At its height, the empire encompassed most of southeastern Europe to the, to the gates of Vienna, uh, including present-day Hungary, the Balkan region, Greece, and parts of Ukraine. Portions of the Middle East, uh, today's Iraq, Syria, Israel, and Egypt, North Africa, as far west as Algeria, and large parts of the Arabian Peninsula. And as you can see, Ottomans had a very strict policy to control the Indian uh, ocean trade that reaches to Mediterranean, east and west, and north and south. This guided most of their ex expansionism in the east, at least. I was born in 1965, and when I was a little child, I remember my grandfather and my grandmother were keeping their private notes in what we call Ottoman script. Uh, this is my grandmother and grandfather in 1930s with my mother and aunt uh, sitting in their garden in Bafra, a very close city in the northern Black Sea. This, this is not their handwriting. I couldn't find their handwriting here, but this is an Ottoman author's private note to a friend. Uh, but it took just to give you an idea of the handwriting, which is uh, an Arabic-based script. So when they were asked, they were strong Kemalists and supporters of Inunu uh, and uh, one party era. And uh, they were also the last Ottomans and the first Republicans because they were born under the Ottoman rule but had the trans experienced the transition into early Republic. And they were kind of upper middle class family uh, living like that, 
And when they were questions like, oh, you're so supportive of Atatürk and his reforms, why are you still using this old alphabet which was changed in 1928 and this is now 70s, they would say like, I know it is easier to take note with in this script. So there was this kind of, these are, uh, I think this was one of the first traces of some kind of an Ottoman culture I uh, experienced in my life. Uh, and this also uh, impl implied some kind of polarization between what Atatürk stands for and Ottomans. So Atatürk versus Ottomans was kind of a polarization many Turks experienced on either side or in the shades of it. I remember at second grade uh, being mortified, uh, this is one of my earliest memories, when a classmate of mine by the name of Suleiman, I don't know where he is now, but this <laughs> incident makes me remember his name, and I don't remember to call any of my uh, you know, uh, second grade uh, classmates, uh, when he told me that Atatürk was an atheist who betrayed the Sultan. I remember this statement, like Atatürk batana inedir, sultana ihan edildi. For some reason, it stuck with me because uh, I couldn't know much about Atatürk, what he has done, or, uh, or about which Ottoman Sultan he was talking about, most probably he was talking about Vahdettin, who was the last Ottoman Sultan. Uh, but I remember still like crying and running, running home to my mother, like, I, oh, my classmate told this about Atatürk, etc. And my mother just brushed it off, saying, and all those Gerici, like those that part conservative people don't mind them, etc. But uh, this is just an example of how important, even for a nine-year-old, this kind of a polarization, because it was important, obviously, for Suleiman as well, from a different perspective, like he was more anti -attitude. Uh, in my uh, locality, uh, there were many definitions of Atatürk versus Ottoman. So Ottomans were, in fact, uh, we talk about magnificent century and their comeback, Ottomanism, etc. But they were, in fact, everywhere. Uh, even in my secular and deeply Atatürkist home, uh, historical novels in my mother's library, uh, films in movie theaters, uh, like uh, very common posters in coffee houses, etc. This is by a late 19th century painter, Italian painter Zonaro, uh, depicting uh, Mehmet II entering Constantinople as a victorious sultan. Here is a 50s movie about the conquest, Istanbul and Fethi, and this is uh, one of the most popular uh, 1940s, 50s novelists. Feridun Fazıl Tülbenç's uh, novel that is titled Yavuz Sultan Selim Cries. It's a very, very dramatic novel, it's very interesting as well. Um, but uh, what I am trying to say with these slides as well, that Ottomans were always there, with some conflicting emotions about them. Uh, on the one hand, there were people like Mehmet II, Yavuz Sultan Selim, who was the conqueror of Me uh, Mecca and Medina, Egypt, etc. Who, who Turks were proud, like the new Turks, Republican Turks, but on the other hand, uh, it was kind of a strange pride because a legacy of Ottomans should last until when Republic or Atatürk was mentioned or is mentioned. On the other hand, Ottomans were Turks when it is necessary. As this supplement to uh, uh, one of the Republicanist uh, paper, Cumhuriyet, from the fifth, 500th uh, anniversary of uh, the conquest of Istanbul, says it says like Turkish Istanbul, but the depiction is Mehmet II, the conqueror, like a sun shining over an Ottoman foot soldier, most probably Ulubatla Hasan, this legendary soldier who put the first flag on the castle. Uh, so there are all these legends and etc. continuing in the Republican Turkey. However, while there were anti-Kemalists who have dreamt of an Ottoman Empire of their own, there were also people like my uncle who lectured young, righteous, tough guys of 70s about how Atatürk collaborated with the last Ottoman Sultan Vahdettin to establish the Republic. According to this story, Ottoman family were not abdicated, but they sacrificed their throne for a modern Turkey. So there are all these different stories going on. These traces of Ottomans that I have gathered 
through memory do not throw much, uh, throw much, but the fact that they were varying and mostly conflicting accounts of Ottoman past among Turkish people, and Ottomans established an ambiguous phase of Turkish history for everyone who are for or against their legacy for very different reasons. While certain narratives denigrated the Ottoman past, generally targeting the palace practices, elitism, uh, others found value in the multi-ethnic social environment that would appear in the form of nostalgia, as a topic of nostalgia, in parallel with the rising identity politics in post-1980 Turkey, uh, when different ethnic, religious, and gender groups grow their voices and uh, when majority discovered that Turkey has not always been a homogenized homeland of Turks, but displayed, in fact, a mosaic of cultures. This was one of the phrases that came up during 80s in tourism, Ministry of Tourism's propaganda of Turkey. This was kind of unthinkable in 70s or 60s to some degree, uh, because this mosaic represented non-Muslim groups, etc. Uh, in my personal life, my discovery was that uh, most of the houses in Samsun, my homeland, which is in the northern Black Sea, uh, Black sea region in the northern Turkey, uh, most of the houses that I admired were remains from a population who left Turkey by, who had left Turkey by 1930s. An untold story that my grandparents never shared with us a reality they most probably either suffered or enjoyed because they were getting really nice stone houses in the form, but it stayed as an experience of a loss, uh, something lacking because they lived with those people until uh, 1930s. I still wonder how I didn't even question why a major district in Samsun was and still is called being called Ermeni Mahalles, Armenian district, and another. Rum Mahalis or Greek district, while there weren't even one Armenian or Greek living in town in the 70s. Now, this slide shows Samsung, and if you look in the middle, you can see the dome of a church, and on right hand side of it, there is the mosque, and uh, it is not very visible here. This is not a very well scanned copy of this very old postcard. There is a large Armenian church as well. Those churches disappear today, and the city, of course, uh, spread all around the empty spaces that you see. But uh, no traces of at least the religious mm -hmm. Ottoman sultans, the erasure of a multi-ethnic past, uh, does not explain why I am a scholar of Ottoman literature. It is related to the traces of an imperial language. There is one Turkish author, Halit Ziyan Shakligi, uh, a very important author, an excellent novelist, I think, in any language. I don't call him Turkish novelist, but he wrote in Turkish. He serialized a novel under the title of Yasak Ashk, originally Ashk Memnu, or uh, in English translation it is Forbidden Love. It's an amazing novel, unfortunately not translated into English. It is available in German. Um, the novel published in book form in 1900. This is the, uh, one of the prints in Ottoman Turkish. Uh, and then, however, after the 1928 alphabet reform, we can talk about this later if you don't know about it, uh, that followed a reform movement in Turkish language, which uh, kind of gets rid of certain foreign, that that's translates like Arabic and Persian grammatical rules in Turkish. Uh, Uşak Ligil, the author, rewrote the whole novel so that people can understand his language uh, in 1939. Like 39 years made a huge difference among readers in understanding uh, Turkish, written Turkish. Why? Because there is the whole uh, Republican project of uh, education which enabled masses to learn how to read and write. This was a very successful project but it rendered much of the uh, Ottoman uh, literature and uh, writing uh, unaccessible to some degree because that education project also uh, aimed at creating a purer, purer Turkish. So uh, this novel, when I started reading it as a high school uh, student in this edition, uh, fifth printing of it, I wasn't able to understand most of what is, uh, most of the 
the vocabulary. I would, I would say one fourth of the vocabulary. So I started using a dictionary to read that novel. I don't know why it must have been really capturing my attention. Uh, and uh, then through this practice of reading a novel with a dictionary, I started learning more and more Arabic and Persian origin words, and they were intriguing for me. So I, my interest in literature and these changes developed. So I ended up applying for a Turkish language and literature department. Meanwhile, the recent editions of the novel are total translations, new translations in the modern Turkish, because otherwise this edition would not be readable. And the novel really became very famous again, thanks to a TV show from 2008, I guess, Ashkomen No, which also went abroad from India to Greece. It became a very popular TV show, but uh, that show updates the novel and makes the story taking place now, today, in Istanbul, in a very rich and, uh, I don't know what, attractive family of, and some people, young woman, excellent clothing, etc. Um, be before finishing my words, the training to understand Ottomans uh, is based on linguistic instruction on uh, archival and narrative sources because when you think about it from 14th century on we have a lot of documentation from Anatolia. Ottomans were amazing archive keepers. Like they kept every transaction, the judge records, the land registers, etc. So, uh, and only, I, I don't know how much of it uh, has been currently tapped or studied, but not much. Those are still require uh, scholars' attentions, and it requires really strong training in Arabic and Persian languages, as well as all forms of rhetorical devices, genres, social and historical contexts that cause transformations in the language. It is a lifelong ordeal, and it will never come to an end. This makes me happy, because I always have material to work on. Uh, to understand a lost sense of human expression, it is not unlike like studying Hittite cuneiform forms or Greek ancient Greek writing. Uh, when I was uh, growing up and developing a tendency towards this knowledge, Ottoman Empire and Ottoman Sultans, as well as Ottoman culture, were disdained and pushed aside as a shadow over modernity. I tried to give a sense of how conflicting it was. This was, an, I think, caused by an anachronistic and irrational fear felt against something dead and long gone. There were only uh, conflicting feelings. Today, what has been suppressed, uh, in a sense, comes back to us for its due, because there have been a lot of work on Ottoman Empire, scholarly work I am talking about. Uh, but unfortunately, its apparitions on the social uh, surface of the social events is in the form of an anachronistic and irrational desire this time, not fear. The desire for empire is as ill-formed as the repudiation of it. Ottoman Empire was a highly sophisticated construct with its separate palatial, military, and religious hierarchies that relied on an intricate and constantly checkered taxing system. It was like many other great empires, like Roman Empire, British Empire, or Habsburg Empire, which ruled over multi-ethnic and multilingual communities. However much it may evoke similarities to current state structures, however, uh, historical realities that created are definitely not commensurate with ours today. So uh, it is kind of this nostalgia or neo-Ottomanism is an ill-formed term in my opinion. Even though the distance between us and the empire grows, and the last Ottomans, those who were born under the empire, have already left us, Ottoman Empire will be remembered, like, uh, as I mentioned, other empires. My work remembers it through its poetry and literature. The possibilities it provided, the language of, uh, developed in archival uh, workplaces, uh, provided people uh, with an expression, a special expression, traces of which survives in court or popular literary and poetic uh, writing. Ottoman poets and authors talked a lot about love. This love was an expression like when they even eulogized the sultan, they uh, treated them as their beloved, like they wrote a love song for a sultan, not a political song. 
This love was an expression of a mystical separation and a disdain for the world they lived in. Separation started at the beginning of the creation, when the human being was creation, when soul gained its bodily form, and what is material buried the spiritual. So poetry was uh, at the work of evoking and reviving this, um, this kind of uh, buried spirit. Uh, and they uh, created uh, thousands and thousands of lyric poems. I want to end my talk after showing you this slide about the uh, alphabet before, in fact, I'm sorry. This is a slide, but this uh, cartoon and about shows how the Arabic letters are leaving. It says the immigration, the migration, like they're leaving, they get together, and the new alphabet introduced in 1920s. Okay, uh, this is Istanbul. I don't need this slide anymore. But uh, this one may be good. I want to read you an Ottoman Turkish poem, which was written by uh, Fatih Sultan Mehmet, Mehmet the Conqueror. And the poem, I won't translate it for you, but uh, the poem uh, talks about uh, a person, most probably a boy, uh, who has a sun face and who is the uh, moon of the universe in his beauty, uh, kind of. And it ends. Uh, Intriguingly, by this line, when he says, "Sen Istanbul Shahı isen Ol Galata Şahıdır," he talks to the, he where the poet talks to himself, addresses himself, saying that if you are the king of Istanbul, this beauty is the king of Galata, which is an adjacent city to Istanbul, Galata district today. So let me read it to you because this sound, I think was something that captured my attention and caused my interest in this poetry, which is a very layered creation. And it goes this way. Bir güneş yüzlü melek gördüm ki alem mahıdır. Ol kara sümbülleri aşıkların ahıdır. Karalar giymiş mehitaban gibi ol servinaz. Mülkü efrencin meğer kim hüsn içinde şahıdır. Ukdeyi zünnarına her kimse kim dil bağlamaz. Ehli iman olmaz ol, aşıkların gümrahıdır. Gamzesi öldürdüğüne dedleri canlar verir. Var ise o ruh bahşın dini İsa rahıdır. Avniya kılma güman, kim sana ram ola nigar. Sen İstanbul şahıysan ol Galata şahıdır. Thank you very much.